Welcome back to the Dave Kittle Show. I am Dave Kittle, owner of Concierge Pain Relief, Home Physical Therapy, and the CEO of the Fieldmaker Group. We're currently speaking with practice owners about partnering or acquiring some or all of their practice. And today we're speaking with Ed Motherway. He is a previous C-suite executive, a private equity executive, a board member, sits on many boards, a board advisor, a turnaround expert. We're going to get into all that. Ed, welcome on. Thanks, Dave. I'm glad you had me on. I'm sorry it took a little while for me to get here, but uh, I've looked at several of your podcasts. It's really great stuff. Uh, I'm sure there's a broad audience from different directions who can appreciate the content, and I'm thrilled to be a part of it. Absolutely. I appreciate your time. And I know we spoke a little while ago, and you had a, a bunch of different stints with a bunch of different companies. But one thing that I definitely want to focus on today is some of your private equity background with a firm that was... Uh, looking at several different healthcare practices, including primary care. And in the pre-interview, you were talking about uh, labs and MRIs and pain management. And, you know, at least one of the offices of pain management had physical therapy in it. Ultimately, I think from what we're talking about in the pre-interview, just kind of like helping the listeners here, whether it's they're looking to buy practices or they're looking to sell practices, or they're looking to maybe sell some of their practice to a corporate or or some other strategic, or maybe even to us, who knows? Um, but hearing some of those stories, obviously anonymously, but hearing why you guys, and I think the number was something like you looked at like 35 practices, and I think maybe you, you guys acquired 14 of them, and you can correct me if I'm wrong there, um, but why you guys ended up pursuing and completing approximately 14 of those deals and those partnerships and why some of the other ones fell through or that you passed on. So those are the types of things I think that we can kind of dive into. And I know that the audience will appreciate that. And again, part of why I love talking about this stuff is a lot of the, this nuanced like case studies and why you know firms and, and companies bought or partnered with some practices and passed on others. There's not a lot of this out there. There's some case studies there. There's you know different financing case studies, but there's not a lot of the nuanced uh, conversations and owners and, and sellers really only get to the point of hearing some of these stories. I, I believe if they kind of engage a broker or advisor, and then the broker advisor maybe tells them some of the, you know, industry anecdotes or, or things like that. But I think getting into that will provide a little bit or shed a little bit of light into some of these experiences that you've had. And so that these uh, practice owners can be a little more savvy, a little more experienced when they uh, go to maybe take that step. Sounds good. Sounds good. Yeah. I, um, I'd love to uh, tell a few stories uh, during our conversation here. Got a few scars to show from, from our time there. But, um, but, you know, as we were discussing earlier, you, you get better and better with each deal. And, uh, and that certainly was the case with us. The numbers are a little bit different. We looked at somewhere in the uh, low, mid, to, mid to low 20s, I think. And I think we closed uh, a little under 10. So I, I think the number seven for deals um, but there's a variety of reasons, um, some capital constraints, simple, good practices, but there's others as well that um, as we got savvier in the due diligence, we um, we decided not to not to fund the deal. But um, but yeah, definitely a lot there. And um, and I think it can be helpful. Great. And all of this uh, was with Greenfield Hill Partners or was this also with some other firm or company? Yeah, no, the um, so the primary care uh, roll up that, that uh, you wanted to focus on, that was uh, called Family Care Partners. Uh, the name of the business has since been changed. And, um, and we're based out of South Carolina. So the roll up was basically across the Carolinas. We bought practices in North Carolina and South Carolina. Um, our headquarters were up, up near the Charlotte area. But the intent was to build this platform um, in, in that geography in a hub and spoke model. So we had all of our own ancillaries and, um, and these hubs, and then we bought practices, the spokes around us, and then uh, all of that activity that those spokes would have from an ancillary standpoint was driven internal um, to our organization. And that primarily was the investment thesis. Got it. And just for anyone that's watching or listening that, that doesn't know, can you kind of define a roll-up or a roll-up strategy? Yeah, sure. It's uh, just a, a rapid acquisition strategy of um, whatever the specialty, if you will, particularly in healthcare. So if you're doing a orthopod roll-up, a derm roll-up, um, certainly a dental roll-up, that's just a rapid acquisition um, at, a, uh, at a certain multiple. 
and um, you try to average a certain multiple and then um, create enough value so that um, so that you can exit at, at a much higher uh, a much higher multiple and preferably although I think it's um, it's harder to do is if you can create a significant organic value you've hit a home run every dollar of organic value if you can exit at 10x that's 10 you know that that's quite a multiple on on one of those elements so uh, but that's that's essentially what we what we were doing got it and in your history in regards to like the the multiple spread there do you or, or the industry of what you've seen is it usually like you're trying to i don't know double the multiple or or is there some spread or number like if you're looking to acquire practices back then or even in the last five or 10 years, maybe at like a three or four X EBITDA multiple, and then you package them up into a portfolio. And if the market dictates that it's, you know, possible and, and the market is interested in, in acquiring or buying that, then you're trying to sell it at, you know, seven or eight X EBITDA multiple. So it's almost like maybe you're doubling the EBITDA multiple. Is there like thought process of like a specific number or is it always like we're trying to you know, double the the multiple of what we acquire these practices at. Is there some approach there? Yeah, I think when you when you do the pro forma, you 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 have a specific number that you want to buy at, and then certainly a specific number uh, multiple that you want to sell at. However, circumstances dictate both of those, right? So so the more popular the um, specialty that you're buying drives up. The multiple where you, we, we you actually hit it on the head, Dave. We were trying to stay between three and four x. Um, that being said, you know you you what we're trying to do and what the seller wants. If there's too much of a gap and you can't get the deals closed, you're going to have to move on that. And then when when you go to to sell, it's the same thing. It's what whatever the market will bear, um, and uh, and and that market. Even though you can find data out there that says, "Hey, this is what the you know exit multiples are for Derm now," it's it's really the circumstances of that transaction, and we can even look at today um, the multiples on both sides of the deal are different than they were just a year and a half ago. So again, it's a lot of circumstances that go into that. But yes, it, it, like everything, you have some some targets. Um, established and to try to stay within those guardrails. Got it. And so with that roll up, you got you said you were looking at about 20 practices and then you guys acquired 10 of them? Roughly, yeah. Got it. So let's go into some anonymous, you know, anecdotes of like, <laughs> if you can kind of give some examples of like, some from the side of like, here's why we acquired and partnered with 10 of them and then why we either passed or the deals fell through on the other 10. Um, yeah. We yeah. kind of talked about previously sure. like diff different things that can happen or, or have happened. What, what have you seen in terms of um, surprises, things that like popped up or things that, you know, made the, the process like super smooth and like was, you know, easy and, and some that were challenging or where you had to walk away and there was, you know, some deal killer. Yeah, so I would say the underlying uh, guidance of managing expectations on both sides and being as transparent as possible is key to having a good post-acquisition relationship. Unfortunately, though, that um, it, it's the sellers aren't necessarily uh, um, you haven't done a lot of deals. They have different types of advisors. Sometimes it's their CPA, sometimes it's their attorney, and sometimes they don't have that. And they're trying to process everything and make the right choice for them. Um, and then uh, from an uh, acquisition standpoint, we're trying to get a deal done. And sometimes in that dance, um, perhaps the decision is, well, there's some things that, you know, the best not, that we talk about those, you know, that that uh, eh, they might kill the deal, and we don't really. It's not that big, and 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 that happens on both sides. And I find that that's a that's a recipe for trouble. Um, uh, before we, um, the PE firm had purchased a base business, and uh, before they put the executive team in, and that base business was under the impression that they basically could keep operating just as they operated before, except they had a big check in their pockets. 
Well, as you start to build a larger organization, a more professional organization, you can't have practices just operating like it's the Wild West and they just sort of do do whatever they were doing before, except they're a little more a little more wealthy. And um and that was what I would consider that was a mistake. It was it was prior to any of us coming in here, but to give that perception that that would be the environment really caused a lot of management issues going forward. And um and I will say, you know, that we did buy some practices subsequently that had some other unique um, management issues that we thought we had resolved in the due diligence process, and they end up not being resolved. So I'll give you another case in point. Uh, we bought this practice in Charleston, and it was, um, it was, there was one owner. However, he had for quite some time, he'd had his wife in there as sort of the office administrator. We detected during the, the, um, during the, the due diligence that, you know, that, that dynamic caused a lot of tension um, for the staff in the office. And so over the course of due diligence, we were able to uh, tactfully broker that, um, that uh, the, the, the doctor's wife would retire. Uh, a practice administrator had been hired, and um, and we thought we had the the issue resolved. Um, shortly after we closed, uh, the two week transition turned into a four week transition, turned into a six week transition, and we had a great deal of difficulty um, getting getting uh, that executed, if you will, where the, the doctor's uh, wife. Ended up, would end up leaving. Um, and what we ended up experiencing was a lot of what the staff was experiencing that we detected in the LOI. There were all sorts of issues in how that, uh, that office was run. Humorously, I guess, you know, this is uh, something that was funny, but um, at one point, um, the wife called our HR representative on her husband. So we had to... Uh, <laughs> we oh, had boy. To Jeez. <laughs> so, so again, it's one of those things, though, Dave. When you were um, uh, you're looking at this, and you're sort of, sort of seeing the, the danger signs, and you're also want to impress upon people is that that you're now one of many. It doesn't mean that our relationship is any less personal. It's just that we're you have you had six providers prior. Now there's 106. So, so. Y- there has to be some acknowledgement that we are now trying to manage a, a large spread of uh, of people and facilities, and therefore, you know, establishing how that rhythm should work. Both sides have to be accommodating um, in that regard. But it's perfectly understandable because to see why it's 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 a bit of a hurdle because if I'm running my own show then I'm dictating every day how something is going to happen. I'm not asking right. for permission. I'm not, you know, I, I don't, but now I'm part of this bigger apparatus. I'm still running kind of my office, but, you know, I, I, it, it's, it's, a, it's a new dynamic. And, um, and some people, some uh, providers and provider, practice owners are better at it than others. Got it. Now, just to kind of see through uh, a little bit of what you're saying earlier, you were kind of suggesting that maybe you guys didn't have a, a formal, I'm, I'm sure you had a playbook, but maybe you didn't communicate uh, well enough to the potential sellers that there was going to be a lot of change. And maybe maybe that, I, and I'm, not, I'm sure you did, and maybe they didn't fully understand it because it's the first time that they're selling and they're going through this transition. Um, but then also I think certain buyers might try to maybe downplay the potential change that uh, to to maybe get the deal over the line instead of saying like you know we're gonna have uh, so much change that your your team is gonna get you know frustrated or flustered or they might quit or we're changing you know the the billing system the medical record the payroll software we're changing whatever other software we're supporting functions um, and and humans don't like change I've said it a million times on the show like people you know fear change and and if especially for a practice like a primary care physician, uh, they probably have been in business for, you know, years, if not decades. 
And change like that certainly could shock or frustrate a lot of folks. So looking back on it, do you think that you did communicate the potential areas of change well enough, or maybe some of these sellers didn't really understand or acknowledge these areas, certain areas that would be changing? Yeah, I think we got better at communicating as, as because as strange as this sounds, very early on, there was a, a sort of a mantra that, that was um, saying required of us, but this was the PE firms but they thought that this was a strategic advantage was that to be a buyer and communicate that we're a buyer, but we're not going to change very much and that that would be a differentiator. So that caused some of the early dysfunction, if you will. Um, when I talk, you know, that base practice was probably the most acute management issue we had because it very much was, the auspices under which which they sold. Um, so, uh, yeah, it, it's it's something that, like I said, we got better and better about identifying um, what what would change and um, and uh, and what wouldn't. Or be as transparent as possible. I think though that this is an opportunity for us to touch a little bit on on the seller side, and when that due diligence is very much something that they need to um, be very good at. And if they're not good at it and they're not sure what to do to get an advisor um, uh, for that specific activity, because um, at no time, uh, at, at one point we had five EMRs and the strategic intent was to consolidate, get down to a couple at, at worst case. It was a reporting Nightmare and um, and not something that that a, a lot of people struggle with it in the in the M and A space, but um, at no time do I recall a specific conversation with all but one practice about hey, I'm on Greenway, <laughs> are you going to change? I mean, are we going to do that at some point? And it was just something that didn't come up. It came up in ten percent of the conversations. Um, I can think of, of two practices. One, they were still on paper and we converted them to an EMR almost immediately after acquisition, which was okay because the providers were uh, in the early to middle stage of their career, not having already burnt the calories to train on one, they were more amenable to an EMR. And in the other scenario that I can recall was an extremely well-run practice. It was down in Jacksonville, North Carolina. The CEO of that practice was, um, we ended up not closing that deal, but it was a funding um, issue. But he, uh, I was really looking forward to partnering with him. And um, we can touch on, on relationships like that uh, a little bit later. But they had purchased um, uh, their EMR and had a fairly robust IT capability and customized it quite a bit. And so they certainly did not want to come off of that. And so that was a topic of discussion. But you figure two out of uh, two out of many um, where that is a that's a significant change. That's that's considered to be a, a disruptor um, for providers when they have to undergo some sort of a, a, a retraining on something that it took them a while to get good at in the previous version of whatever they were using. So um, so, yeah, I, I mean, I, I think that it's a two way street. Um, and, uh, and, and those are things as well is to see if you can establish a level of transparency and start building a true partnership instead of, uh, we, we, we put a number out there for the LOI and I'm trying to preserve my number as a seller and as a buyer, I'm trying to see if there's, there's room in that number where I knock it down. I think you're already in tricky territory if that's the disposition of the relationship and that doesn't get fixed relatively soon in the due diligence um, phase. Right. Maybe we'll come back to that really uh, exceptional practice that you guys didn't partner with because it sounds like they probably were asking for too much or something like that or, or, or 
maybe market rate, but they were asking for a competitive bid maybe. Let's get real quick into the nitty gritty. So you had mentioned in the pre-interview, uh, one practice that like just had $500,000 kind of disappear off the financials, off the books. What do you think or what did go on there? And, um, you know, the, again, these are these are the anecdotes and the real stories that we want to hear about that, you know, as long as they're anonymous, that um, these are things that like, to, to be quite frank, any, any practice owner watching or listening, like we're going to find it, right? If we have a, a good team, forensic accountant or or law firm or whatever and doing perform due diligence like we're going to look at the inflows and outflows of the business and we're going to find some of these you know gaps in in dollars right so like what what happened there or what do you think happened there yeah well there's a uh, one exercise that's done for for each function um for our due diligence if you will um there's a, a fairly significant checklist whether that's it whether that's hr Certainly, the financial side has a very robust um, robust checklist. And so one of the activities is just a proof of cash. And as you said, Dave, inflows and outflows. So you've got an operating account. You've claimed X amount of revenue. And now we're looking, we're just on a monthly basis, looking at the inflows into your operating account. In this particular practice, we weren't able to locate for, for it, it was cumulative over a period of three months. But... Um, we were five hundred thousand dollars short, and um, there wasn't a really good explanation um, as to why that was there. Um, that uh, those types of of um, situations, uh, considering the size of this practice, where five hundred thousand dollars was, eh, I want to say, right about seventeen percent of the total revenues, so it's significant and immediately we just slowed down that ended up never closing um it would never close because that didn't get resolved in the time uh where uh you know the, the private equity firm exited the the uh, the play uh, but it could have closed had that um issue been satisfactorily explained and understood but it just sort of uh, went into that when when we get the answer sort of column and and feel comfortable, um, then we'll close. But uh, but yeah, there's some very very simple techniques. Um, but you know you do find after the fact, and this is it goes back to trying to get better. There is a cat and mouse game. There are things that happen, and and then and once you once you get the scar. Uh, provided it's not debilitating you, that gets added into something that you might look for. I'll give you something else that's totally, totally off the, the check in the box. Let me look at my checklist and those sort of things that we learned over time too. And it's reputation. So um, this one practice that we owned had a particular reputation that we found out afterwards that several other practices in the immediate area that we wanted to buy um, said, you know, you guys bought practice A. We don't want to work with you. We don't want to work with those guys. We're proximate to them. You know, we're within a few miles of them. We know them and we don't want anything to do with them. And that gave us some pause and said, you know, that's something that that hurt our strategic prospects because we really would have loved to scoop up some very, very good and strong practices that were proximate to this one that we bought. And they it, shot but it, and, that, and, and that's in that situation, you had to pick one or the other, basically, like uh, go after one or the other. You couldn't, you we, couldn't partner. We with didn't them. know. We didn't know. We partnered and then started to tap those around it and we got shut oh, okay. down. Got and it, and it. what made it more pain, what made it more painful is they did end up selling to other PE firms. So they were in play. Uh, they just um, and and later, you know, there was more cumulative information that the the practice that that was purchased had uh, both both with patients, peers, um, attorneys, uh, you name the the constituency, if you will, and did not have a a very good uh, good reputation. So, uh, in in that realm when you're getting recommendations from people referrals and those sort of things a little more thought as to it when i say recommendations and referrals on practices that might be good for us to acquire we developed a deeper level of um, evaluation in that regard if we could obviously without 
betraying confidences that we were actually that we were in the acquisitive mode with with one or two of these practices. But we did uh, attempt to see what their standing in the community, I guess, to put it tactfully, might be, um, and and do that in in a very uh, uh, subtle subtle manner. Got it. Um, so going back to that practice that with the 500K that kind of was unaccounted for, um, you said that was like 17% of the revenue. So about 3 million top line and it, 17 or 20% of that is around 500K. So was the three, they were doing about 3 million and that was what was on like their, that's what they were declaring to the IRS and that was like on their books or, or what was the scenario there with what they like? How the revenue and like what they were actually declaring as uh, top line revenue. What they could say for there was just that discrepancy, and even in other parts we found we so we still have to find like where is this money, um, and just over the course of that, and I can't quite recall all of the different uh, locations. I, I just remember the proof of cash was the first one that popped it, and then that started the conversation. And uh, we never could get a satisfactory resolution that we were comfortable with. And it was, it got murkier as we went on. And, um, and so that, that's, that's what I recall. And then of course that we just sort of tabled it until we could get some resolution, never got it, never closed. Got it. So you said proof of cash, but it, that was like part of your quality of earnings or like what was, that was during that process? Yeah. Yeah, well, you you've it's just your your monthly inflows to your operating account, and does that match what you've declared as your as your revenue? Now, and so, if there's a disconnect, there has to be some sort of an explanation. Um, it, so it, it 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 sounds like an owner draw, maybe off the books, <laughs> Ill, Ill, illegal cash owner draw, but like not a formal owner draw, just, just taking, just writing checks to themselves maybe, or who knows, or, or pocketing yeah. like the, the cash, like the actual copay cash could have been. Yeah. Well, whatever, whatever way it was, we never got the, the explanation. There's a few that you've just thrown out that could have been, but um, you know, you get to the point it's you no, know, <laughs> to, uh, it's not for us to understand. It's for us to, for you to help us understand, kind of thing. And right. um, and this this is pretty basic. And then you know when things like that happen, and the explanation is not easy, straightforward. Several people can look and connect the dots. Then you start to wor worry about other elements that may have given you modest pause, but uh, but not enough to kill the deal. And then you start to think about those and you say, well, if, if we're having some issues on this one, is is that what you would put as a, a modest risk? Is that actually a bigger risk that we'll discover somewhere down down the pipe? So, um, th th you know, these are things that, that, that all get incorporated in. And as you get better and better, you know, you start to see these, the, the, the red flags, um, if you will, um, but, but again, you know, it's the dynamics of, of what you might run into and then, and what you might accommodate, they're constantly shifting. I mean, I remember, um, it got purchased by somebody else, uh, because again, we ran into a situation where we had several that were ready to fund and our investors decided not to fund. And this one, he was the senior partner at this practice, fantastic practice. Um, very, uh, uh, very engaging guy, uh, was uh, renowned in the area, speaker, those sort of things. Um, but uh, but every conversation is very, very nice guy. But every conversation, I mean, he wouldn't he wouldn't go get the newspaper for you without charging you an upcharge. Like everything led back to, well, yeah, I can do that for you, but that's 25 grand. I can do that for you, but I've got to get a little extra here. I've got a little, every single thing was, was couched in, in, in a deal. And, um, which didn't stop us at all because it really ran a very, uh, a very good, uh, organization with tremendous, um, uh, upside. But, um, but again, that's something else where you're gauging and saying, are we going to constantly be in some sort of a dance with this, this person um, who carries a lot of influence? He was, the, he was the top guy, top partner at this practice. People respected him um, uh, widely, 
but those are things that you sort of have to gauge um, before entering into uh, these relationships because like I said they will um, you know they will bite you um, afterwards we had uh, we had another one where we where it was a limited partnership they had I think about 20 providers but three partners who sold uh, to us and um, and one of those partners carried most of the clout he had started the practice some time ago and carried most of the clout and um, and was was very solid uh, person uh, however had sort of wielded the power even over his two partners there were deals behind the scenes where they had uh, those two partners had purchased more and more of his share, and he was becoming more of a limited partner, but maintained that sort of authoritarian uh, approach. And um, we ended up um, bringing on a chief medical officer. And I remember the chief medical officer having a terrifically difficult time uh, working with with that doctor. And it was just because he had 40 years of traction and had done things a certain way was selling because the the practice was was sizable but not operating anywhere near its potential uh, even given all of that tenure and um but didn't want to change that much and wanted wanted to pay wanted things to stay the same and um and that was a good example however of how we got better because we went in and negotiated the changes during due diligence that we were going to make and had to be accepted that would fix the performance of this practice before closing on the deal and even though that even though that doctor uh the senior partner was a little prickly everyone else understood what it was we were going to do for the betterment of the practice in order to juice their performance and we did and we were successful in doing that i would attribute the the that doctor's disposition just again towards a lot of tenure for running a, 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 his his business for a long time and um uh, there's a little finesse when with each of these personalities as to how you um how you develop a decent decent partnership yeah got it uh, let's wrap up with this. Uh, you mentioned a couple of times tremendous practice or tremendous practices that you looked at. So a couple of those, what would be some of the defining factors? So maybe it's like they have great marketing or great uh, word of mouth in the community. Maybe they are, you know, compliantly and legally kind of optimizing billing and revenue cycle management and coding um, team members that maybe are. Uh, there's, I don't know, some profit sharing or there's some, you know, sharing of the upside. When you talk about some of those tremendous practices that you looked at, what are some of the commonalities just for some of the practice owners watching or listening? Maybe they can go into those things, yeah. adopt some of those things, use or 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 kind of borrow some of those areas. What what makes some of these practices tremendous in your opinion? Like what are some of those characteristics? Yeah, there are only a handful from what we looked at that I would categorize in that way. And this is a tricky dribble and you have to have enough scale to have this type of organization but the very best practices had someone who was dedicated to running the practice as a ceo um, and so two that stand out they were mds um had basically no, been no longer elected. no longer treating no longer treating no longer no longer treating and again that's a luxury if you but but it should be something from an operating model that you aspire to because the contrast was so was so different. Um, and so what I would qualify when you knew you were going to have a good partner is to sit with these CEOs and you're sharing ideas and they talk about different evolution uh, evolutions, or I should say the evolution of the practice and different solutions that they used and why they focused on this and why we, we actually used to do organic RCM. Then we evaluated third parties in this manner. We went to a third party. We didn't like X, Y, and Z. We pulled it back. I mean, there's active solutioning and management separate from the demands of treating uh, patients. And you could see it in how those practices ran, the discipline in the practice, the professionalism um, uh, across the board in the practice. Um, and all of that is important because um, again, the engine 
the engine is the people in the practice. And if they are operating comfortably in an organized manner and it's not, you know, the wild west and 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 they're extremely uncomfortable because of the dysfunction, if you will, from just a, a lack of that that professional management, um, you know, that has a debilitating effect. So you could see it in the good practices. People were calm. They knew what their role was, and then in the the others, it was um, it, it it was there wasn't that much management, mostly because the people responsible for that management were trying to be full time physicians, as well as 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 running the business. It, and, and so, uh, so it, I think it's, it, 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 I'm sorry to cut you off. It, it's hard to be great at yeah, both. It's hard. It's hard to be full time treating patients, whether it's your physician, physical therapist, dentist, whatever it might be. It's hard to full-time treat a caseload of 40 or 50, maybe 30, 40 hours of patient care, and then, you know, spinning plates with meetings and, you know, overseeing a, a whole bunch of other, all the other functions of the practice, and then also kind of growing it and expanding it and making things like efficient and having, you know, standard operating procedures or a playbook or whatever that's actually being revised and improved and updated over time. I mean, it's, it makes sense that's like for those tremendous practices that there is one or two individuals that are maybe previously uh, practice owners or other healthcare providers, but now they're in like an operations role and no longer treating. It makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Well, I'll, um, I'll give you uh, another hurdle to getting to that, um, getting to that uh, structure is um, typically that person running the practice was a a fully functioning provider in the practice before assuming that role. They got enough scale, they got big enough, and and that and it was determined, you know, by the partnership that that this is what we should do. If you do that, you're taking probably one of your best revenue producers off the table, which is hard to do, right? You, that person comes out from the earning fold, and uh, um, and you have to, to figure out how to. Um, how to replace someone. And it's not as if we say, okay, well, don't you just go get another provider? Well, as we all know, as patients, right? Uh, is it just another provider or you have a preference and there are some that are very good and some that maybe aren't so good and that that's that's a fact. But, um, and that's why I say that that's that's a luxury if, if you're uh, able to do it. But, but it's also, it, it's evolving. So instead of being transactional in how you do something, someone comes in and tries to sell you a machine or something like that, you have someone who has that mind and the view of what will take the practice forward. They've got the time to absorb ideas and think and converse and 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 look for best practices. And if that's not happening, then you're just going to be in this sort of transactional uh, uh, role uh, mode uh, kind of like the the hamster on on the hat trail, running as fast as you possibly can, trying to keep all the balls um, up in the air. But um, but it doesn't. Uh, it's I, I would say it's not effective. The last thing I'll leave you with is you see this a lot in companies in distress, right? So rather than find the the right solution, the right person to come in and fix something, who you, who has a high probability that they will fix it that's going to cost you money so is there something where we can sort of ride the fence can can we come up with something that makes us feel better not as sure of a uh, of an outcome but we feel better because we didn't spend more money and it's sort of like penny wise pound foolish and i would say the same thing here in running your practice you 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 fall behind and um both of the practices that are top of mind for me they were um we did not close on them. They had no problem selling them and selling them for the price that they wanted. Got it. Fair enough. And you can't and you can't get them all, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they're they're getting different offers. You don't know what the other offers are. You know, you might be a little below the the other offers. Who knows? Yeah, I do think though that that those practices as well. Even though the one of those, the particular gentleman, I I, I was jokingly talking about him everything was a deal with him but um but you knew that they would be good partners and and the other side of the partnership is learning from them about how they built this and evolved it yeah and, they're, spe they're special sauce 
they're, they're, they're true partners and, and, and that, that adds to the strength of the overall platform. If you have minds like that with that type of experience contributing, because again, a best practice from, from uh, practice A, which is extremely well run, should be something that the COO looks at and says, how do we, how do we adopt this across the board? So they're right. bringing that type of value to the overall platform, not just a one more cog in the machine of this roll up of acquisitions. And that's how it really should be viewed. And, um, and again, if you really want to win, it's that more planful, evaluative uh, approach where you're solutioning as opposed to transaction, transaction, transaction. And that's how we got to the promised land. Right. Awesome. Uh, great, Ed. I appreciate your time. Good place to pause. If you guys find this interesting and valuable and helpful, go ahead and subscribe to The Dave Kittle Show on YouTube. You can also check it out on iTunes and Spotify. Ed, thank you so much for your time. It's great. Thanks, Dave. Appreciate it. Hey, it's Dave Kittle. Are you a healthcare business owner or physical therapy practice owner who is looking to figure out your succession plan or exit strategy? We might be able to help. And in fact, we may be interested in acquiring your practice. If you're interested, you can reach out to me. Shoot me an email at dave at conciergepainrelief.com. That's D-A-V-E at C-O-N-C-I-E-R-G-E, painrelief.com. Or you can call me at any time, 646-781-8884.